This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 37, and welcome once again to the Homestead Journey Podcast. My name is Brian. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York, If this is your first time joining us here on the podcast, I am so glad that you found us. And if you are a longtime listener, I really do thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us as we talk about our homestead journey, the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. It has been an absolutely wonderful week here on the homestead. We finally got some rain here in upstate New York. Not enough but at least better than what we've been getting. It cooled off a little bit here uh, this week on the homestead as well, so thankful for that. Anyhow, let's jump right into this week's homestead happenings, and I will bring you up to speed with everything we have going on here on the homestead. So as I mentioned in my opening, we did finally get some rain here on the homestead this week. It has been very, very dry. And up until this week, it had been very, very hot, at least for us this early in the season. But this week, we did have a few days where we had some rain, although quite frankly, it still isn't enough to catch up with all of the dryness that we've had up to this point. But today it was enough that it actually forced me to change my plans. (laughs) It forced me to live up to my promise that I had made to you last week. On last week's show, we had talked about homestead safety, and I had promised you that I was going to spend some time this week cleaning up my work space slash garage slash catch-all. And then life happened this week, and I really didn't get around to it. And today I had a few other things that I felt like I really needed to work on. But because of the rain, I did end up spending about four hours working on the garage and some other areas where some junk had accumulated. And while it's not 100%, it's certainly not Instagram worthy. (laughs) And I don't know if it'll ever be Instagram worthy. But uh, I did put a good dent into it and I will keep plugging away at it. But I I do feel a lot better about how things look in that particular place. And not so much about how they look, but just the whole safety component. I don't feel like I'm going to be tripping over stuff, at least not as badly as I was before I went to work on it. This week we also, as would make sense during this time of the year, we spent a lot of time in the garden. Um, Some weeding, but we're starting to achieve a harvest. And that's just what is the exciting part of of, uh, gardening. So we enjoyed some shell peas, or as some people call them, English peas, uh, today for lunch. And they were so good, so sweet. We've also enjoyed a couple of messes of sugar snap peas. And we had some raw one night, and we've steamed some. And uh, my wife did a stir fry of some, just really, really good. Uh, We've done beet greens and uh, enjoyed some spinach from the garden this week. And overall, it's just, it's exciting to start enjoying the fruits of your labor, literally the fruits of your labor. Uh, And and right now, things, at least in the square foot gardens, are looking awesome. In the roost out beds, some things are looking better than others. Uh, The tomatoes are looking okay. They seem to be dragging behind a little bit what's going on in the square foot gardens, but they seem to be okay. The potatoes are going like gangbusters. They've started to flower. I actually hilled them this week with some more straw or some more hay, actually. And uh, let's see what else in the rootstock garden. The uh, I planted some beans, some fillet beans there, and they have sprouted up very, very nicely and really looking good there. My sweet potatoes, they don't look so hot. Um, the one side, it looks like maybe two or three of of the um, vines actually took. The other side looks a little better, but certainly 
I lost, it looks like, more than is going to grow. So I'm not totally sure what I did wrong there. But we'll try again next year with those. But we'll see what we get as far as harvest goes. Some of my squash is looking okay. Some of it doesn't look so hot there in the square foot garden. And I also, I've got to refer back to my plan because I planted some things and I marked them. But the marker I used was a water-soluble marker. It was not a permanent marker. And so I don't know what I planted there. I see things are coming up nicely, but I don't know what it is. So I've got to go back to my garden plan. And hopefully I what I planted there is what I had planned on planting there. And if not, well, we'll see what we get. But whatever it is, it's coming up. The onions are looking okay in, this, in the uh, roost out bed as well. So... Right now, it's looking okay, but the square foot gardens, folks, man, they are jamming, and I am so excited about that. This week, I also did one of my absolute all-time favorite things to do on the homestead, and that is I canned some jam. And in particular, I canned two batches of strawberry jam and one batch of strawberry rhubarb jam. And folks, oh, it feels so good to finally have some jam back in the jelly cabinet. I think this is the first time since I started making homestead uh, homemade uh, jams and jellies here on the homestead that we actually ran out. And part of it is because last year I did not make any currant jelly, and I don't think I made any raspberry jam last year. And so we actually ran, well... We're not totally out because I have some black raspberry jam that I made a whole bunch of years ago that we've never eaten because it was so seedy and I just need to get rid of it. So we had some of that in the in the jelly cabinet. But other than that, we were totally out of jams and jellies with the exception of the lilac jelly that I made this spring. So anyhow, it feels great to have some more jam in the jelly cabinet. My wife and son are also hopefully going to go pick some raspberries this week, and I'll make some raspberry jam. And then in the fall, I'll make another batch of raspberry jam as well as some raspberry hot pepper jam, which is amazing. I absolutely love raspberry hot pepper jam. You put that over some cream cheese and have some crackers with that. Mm, mm, mm. Folks, that is good eating. Whew. Man, I love that stuff. So anyhow, very excited to have that underway, get the canning season kicked off, although I had done that with the lilac jelly. But there's just something about making strawberry jam that to me kind of feels like that, whew, that kickoff to a wonderful canning season. All right, that's what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Been a great week. I certainly hope that it was a good week for you as well. So let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On this week's episode, I am so happy and privileged to be joined by Brenda Scott from the blog WellFedHomestead.com. Brenda's journey into homesteading is one that began on a small suburban lot. And eventually she and her husband and family, well, they achieved that dream that so many homesteaders seem to have. That goal of that 5, 10, 15, 20 acres of land. And in their case, it was actually 30 acres of land. But that goal to be able to have a lot of land on which you can grow all the things and do all the things and raise all of the things. But they also found, well, that be careful what you wish for. That bigger is not always better. And so today, well, Brenda shares with us some of the lessons that they learned on their journey from suburbia to a large farm and back to suburbia again. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. I really, really enjoyed talking with Brenda. So with that said, Brenda, welcome to the show. Thank you. 
So you have been um, homesteading and blogging and sharing with people kind of the the benefits of, of homesteading. Tell me a little bit about uh, how long you've been homesteading. Yeah, so we purchased a farm in 2010. And it was a 30-acre property in Oregon. And we started learning everything. We didn't know anything about raising chickens or cows or anything. We learned everything on that property. Um, And so I started a blog just to kind of help people follow our journey as we homesteaded and and to see what we were learning and to share with people. Because I didn't see a lot of blogs back in 2010 about homesteading. So I thought that would be fun to just share with the world what we were doing. So, so did you grow up around this or was this something that was a total brand new concept to you? It was a total brand new concept. So wow. yeah, my husband grew up on about an acre and they had maybe one animal at a time, like a goose or something. I think they raised one cow when he was growing up and his grandparents owned 280 acres in Montana. So he grew up going to the farm, but by the time he was going there, his grandparents had stopped farming. So they were just living on this big piece of property. Okay. So, so then you guys had basically no background whatsoever in homesteading and you, you bought 30 acres and jumped in both feet kick it. Yes. (laughs) Before we get there though, um, Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about what, what was kind of what drew you to the to the lifestyle? What was kind of what's kind of your backstory and and why you you felt called, shall we say, to to that? Yes. So I love gardening. I um, when we moved into our neighborhood house before that, I immediately planted fruit trees and put grapes in and um, big garden beds. That's just something that I love doing wherever we are, no matter the size of the property. Um, and then I think I really attribute it to me watching Little House on the Prairie growing up. And, um, I felt like I should have been raised back then. Maybe like I should have been one of those farmers. <laughs> I don't know why. But, um, that, that's so funny because those books, uh, I, I'm going to, maybe this is an embarrassing secret for a guy to admit, but I have read through that series probably 10 times and I'm actually reading it again right now. Awesome. That's cool. Yes, we're. Um, I just today I was braiding one of my daughter's hair, and we watched Little House on the Prairie episodes while I braided. So, yep. <laughs> so, and it's funny. There's a lot of people. I mean, I think Jill Wingert um, talks a lot about the the uh, Little House on the Prairie series and the influence that it's had on her. There's a lot of people that have really continued to be influenced by that series, which is just absolutely amazing to me. Yes, definitely. Yes. So when we lived in a neighborhood and our kids were little, I would check out all of the homesteading books at the library. I learned how to make my own cheese. We started picking up raw milk at a local farm. Um, and I just started practicing all these skills in our neighborhood house. So, so how big of a piece of property was that? So that was just, I think, like a 6,000 square foot lot. It wasn't very big at all. Wow. Wow. Even though probably you you didn't realize it at the time, you really started your homestead journey really then. Yes. And and I think sometimes a lot of people think they've got to wait until they get the five, the 10, the 15, the 20 acres of land, but that's really not the case. You can start your journey wherever you're at. Definitely. And so you, you get into, to this, kind of this lifestyle, you're making cheese, you've planted a garden, you've planted some fruit trees. Yes. Um, what other kinds of things were you doing on that property? So also we were visiting farms regularly and the farmer's market. And just because obviously we weren't producing enough on a 6,000 square foot lot for our whole family to eat all year round. So we were visiting local farms and picking tons of tomatoes and then canning um, or picking tons of strawberries and and canning them or freezing. Um, So that's part of the homesteading life we were living then too. Um, And then making yogurt. I started square foot gardening there. Okay. I'm a a big fan of square foot gardening. Yeah, me too. It's what I use still. 
even on the farm when we had 30 acres, I used square foot gardening. It's just I love smart. it. It is. It is. It's great. It's a great system. Yes. Not perfect, but it's a great system. Right. Yeah. And so you were, you're raising, you're, you're raising food now. Now you said you were canning. Um, how did you get into that? That's, that's a skill that some people who have been homesteading for a while are still scared to do. Yeah. And I don't know why I decided to start that. I think my mom used to make freezer jam and my mm -hmm. grandma too. And so I started copying that just started out with freezer jam but I didn't have quite enough freezer space to store all of the jam I wanted for the year. And I wanted to start making fruit syrups and um, salsa. And so I, I just picked up some canning books and just started practicing. Interesting. Now at this point, hot water bath canning only, or did you jump right into pressure canning as well? Just water bath canning at that point. Okay. Yeah. I learned then too, that some of the um, the new hybrid tomatoes, well, they're not so new anymore, aren't quite as acidic. Mm -hmm. So they don't work very well in canning recipes. I learned that back there, back then before we had our farm that you could end up with moldy salsa or just, it wouldn't be good because it, they weren't acidic enough. Right. In fact, what I have just started doing as force of habit with all of my tomatoes is adding lemon juice to bring the yes. acidity up or down or however you want to, what is it? I guess mm -hmm. you're bringing the acidity up. Yes. So, but I just do that as a, as a, as a, as a habit now because of that issue, just because there are so many tomatoes that they have bred to have low acidity. Mm -hmm. And so yep. that definitely affects the ability for them to be canned. So you're canning, you're growing food. Um, now at this point, how many children did you have? Um, so we adopted our fourth child, um, in that house. So four kids, four kids, what were their ages? <laughs> um, so let's see when we ended up moving to the farm from that house, our youngest was three. And then I think our oldest was nine. So nine down to three, nine so, down to three. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And as far as, you know, doing, uh, again, before you moved to the farm, you're, you're doing the stuff on the smaller lot. How involved was the rest of the family? Was this something that just you were doing or was your, your husband in, in with you? Was your, were your kids on board? How was that working out? I mean, I know yeah. it's tough for a four-year-old to be on board, but. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely. So, um, so my husband helped with all of the, the gardening, at least setting up the garden, building the garden boxes that we built and um, setting up where the grapes would be and all of that, planting fruit trees. And he put in drip irrigation for me. I tend to be the one who tends the garden. That's just kind of my thing. Um, but he would support me in that and put the kids to bed at night. And I, I just remember a lot of summer nights being out there with lights on, like the porch lights on and gardening in the dark. So. Mm -hmm maybe because it had cooled down. I don't, I don't know why I did it at nighttime, but, um, and then the kids, you know, I remember, um, we would go pick stuff. They would help pick. Definitely. I think they might've eaten more berries than they actually, you know, uh -huh. got in the bucket. <laughs> oh yeah. But, oh yeah. Yeah. But then I have photos of them standing at the kitchen Island, like on chairs. And when I was canning or, making pumpkin pie out of a fresh pumpkin that we had just picked or something. Um, they would stand there and at least play with the food, <laughs> be a part of it. So great. Yeah. And, and so then at this point you're, you're, where were you located at when you were on that as far as when, what state? So we were in Oregon at that point. So Oregon, it's uh, the Pacific Northwest. It's a little bit, it's kind of, I, I've never been out there, but as I understand it, it's kind of got a, a bit of a, I don't want to say an odd climate, but mm -hmm. is it more of like kind of, some people refer to it as almost a rainforest. Is that correct? Or, or is that yeah. certain parts of it? Yeah, um, it is pretty rainy there. So we we now live in Virginia um, and it rains less here, but it rain, when it rains in Virginia, it rains hard. 
like mm-hmm. harder than it did in Oregon, I feel like. Mm-hmm. But in Oregon, it, you could just count on gray, rainy days a lot, like often. So, And so that does lead to challenges from the standpoint of gardening. Yes. Um, there's yeah. certain things that certain like um, diseases and, and things like that that really thrive in that kind of, of, of environment. Yes, definitely. And I never was able to grow brassicas well in Oregon, and I can, at least I'm growing them right now in Virginia. So it's kind of interesting that they just never turned out well there. And that's interesting to me because I would think that brassicas being a little bit more on the cool weather side of things would do well yeah. um, in that kind of environment. So that, it's very interesting to me. I, I think it's it, that's one of the things with regards to gardening as you kind of move around you understand that what works in one place probably isn't, I shouldn't say probably, there's a good chance it isn't going to work in another place. Right. Um, the climates, uh, just your, it's just so different. And mm-hmm. uh, th- even from the standpoint of understanding, um, you know, maybe you can grow one variety of tomato in your area and, and somebody else can't grow it in that area. Right. And I've been asking around at the farmer's market here because I can't find any um, fruit stands that grow apples or peaches or anything that don't spray their trees here. And in Oregon, we could go to the farmer's market and I could ask around and I could always find at least one stand that didn't spray. Mm -hmm. And here, everybody says, you can't, you can't not spray your trees here. You have to. So Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. But uh, yeah, and then in Oregon, I knew a lady who grew um, blackberries intentionally, not wild blackberries, but had um, blackberries set up for you pick berries and she didn't spray them, but everybody around her did spray. And she said she just prayed over hers every year and every year she got a good crop. And um, I asked about that here and I was told nobody sprays their berries here. You don't have to spray your berries, but you have to spray your fruit trees. So, huh, interesting. It's interesting. different. Has to do probably with the, the pests that would be prevalent in one area versus the other. Yes. Um, very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. So, so you're in Oregon, you're on the smaller piece of property and how did you end up on 30 acres? Yeah. So um, there was a dip in the market, which also meant our house dipped um, in price. But we thought, if we don't jump now, we're never going to get land because it'll go back up again. And so we went for it. We found a bank-owned property. It was almost 30 acres, 29.8, I think, acres. And we could have afforded, at that same time, there was like a four and a half acre lot, or it had a house on it that was in a better condition and had very nice fencing, a nice barn, and the house was in good condition. It was just, um, I think it was 75,000 more than we found our property for. So we could have bought that and we really um, were trying to decide which place to buy, but we thought 30 acres, that's amazing. And Mm so we bought this 30 acre property. And, Was this still in Oregon or where was this located at? Yes, it was still in Oregon. So we were in the Willamette Valley. It's called, um, and we, so the area where our farm was, was about 30 minutes out from where our neighborhood house had been. So kind of out there. (laughs) And at this point, were both of you working or was just your husband working before you moved to the farm? Was, were you, I mean, I assume there was outside income of some sort. Right. My husband was working. I was staying home with the kids at that point. Okay. And then you moved to the farm. Did he continue Mm -hmm. to work or did he just go whole hog, full bore to the farm? So he continued to work um, until we had done a few summers of raising broilers and selling them. And we saw that it worked and and we had um, some dairy cows at that point too. We were doing raw milk and we saw it could work and we penciled it all out. And he decided to take off, like stop working. So, um, so we did that for six months when we were on the farm and that, um, didn't pan out like we thought it would sadly. Um, all those numbers we had calculated didn't quite end up doing what they thought, what we thought. So our 
our feed manufacturer went out of business that year. So the feed that we had fed our chickens and turkeys every year before that suddenly was no longer available. And we had priced our chickens based on that feed. Mm -hmm. And then we had to, we were doing soy free, corn free, organic. It was difficult to find somebody to produce feed like that at, at that time. And we found another feed, but it was more expensive and we had already taken deposits on birds. And then for some reason, turkeys didn't survive well on that feed. We lost a lot of turkeys. And then um, also our chickens didn't get quite as big. They took longer to raise and then they still weren't as big as mm. the year before. So we were raising hundreds of birds and just losing money. It mm -hmm. wasn't it wasn't working well. Gotcha. So you've moved to the farm, you're on this 30 acres and mm -hmm. kind of a little bit of a spoiler alert for the audience. You're in the process right now of writing a book entitled how we failed at homesteading. Yes. And in essence, you learned some tough lessons yes. uh, on that 30 acres um, that we'd like to go ahead and share with everybody. Now I've, I've already told you, I think you're being too hard on yourself by using the word <laughs> failed. <Yes. laughs> because I think all of this is just a learning experience and, it and it's all part of the overall journey. And, uh, but, but anyhow, so I, I'm, I'm not going to beat you up too hard over being too hard on yourself, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but you learned some lessons along the way. And, and really the one that we're going to focus on today is that bigger isn't always better. A lot of people come into homesteading and they, they automatically dream of that five, 10, 15, 20, in your case, 30 acres of land. Yes. But sometimes it's a matter of be careful what you wish for. Yes. Definitely. So what were some of the lessons that you learned along the way that maybe people need to think about before they jump into this? Yeah. So, um, so one thing I would say is if you're getting larger property, oftentimes the larger property, it'll either be more expensive or if it's a good deal, if it's around the same price as that smaller piece of property, usually it's because it has not a very nice house on it. Um, and oftentimes it doesn't have all the fencing and the outbuildings and those things that you don't think about when you're buying property and you haven't owned it before that you really need and mm -hmm. that add up in cost. So and that adds up very, very quickly. Fencing yeah. is expensive if you do it right. Yes, definitely. So our property, it was bank owned. So when the people were losing the property, the people who had it before us, they ripped everything of value out of um, the property. So there were no stalls in the barn. Um, mm -hmm. There was no fencing. There was remnants of, we could see there had been electric fencing before, but they had taken out everything. So it was really starting from scratch for us. And it was all a brand new learning experience. We didn't know how to do any of it. So it would have been easier for us to start with that smaller property um, that was close in, in price that already had all the nice fencing. We could have started quickly. And we also, we did start quickly, a little too quick for, for the infrastructure we had. We immediately ordered chicks and turkeys and ducks and geese. And we didn't have everything set up. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that's such a, such a big mistake I see people who are new to homesteading make. And, and I understand it. They're all excited. They're going to raise and grow their own food. And they want to raise all the things. They want to grow all the things. And it's very, very easy to overwhelm yourself, especially if you're coming at it from with little to no background in raising animals and raising food. Right, right, right. And our property, because it was bank owned and had been neglected, was covered in tansy and blackberries. So it was just overwhelming to start with. It wasn't, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't like we could just jump into planting a large garden because we had a lot to clear. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not easy stuff to clear either. No, it's not. And so got this property, it's, it's lacking infrastructure. You, and so that was kind of, shall we say, lesson number one 
is, yes. you know, when, when you're doing this, understand what you want to do and, and what the infrastructure is going to cost to, to do what you want to do and be honest about it. Right. Um, I think sometimes people have this rosy picture painted in their minds. Uh, but if you're going to do things right, and, and as they say, good fences make good neighbors, <laughs> um, and you want to do it right. And it's also about making sure that your animals are kept where they're supposed to be so they're not getting injured and that your right. kids aren't getting injured by animals getting out where they, you know, all of that stuff is very, very important. So having that infrastructure, but then also not jumping into too many things all at once. Right. But you can do that on a, on a small piece of property as well. I mean, that's mm-hmm. not necessarily something that's just um, unique to having a big piece of property. But I think when you've got more land, perhaps the temptation to fill all that land, to use all that land is a bit greater. Would you agree? Right. Yes, I agree. And then more expensive because if you're fencing 30 acres, that's quite expensive. You know, when you get, like, we got a, a great Pyrenees dog at one point and um, wanted to train it to roam the property. Well, you have to fence the whole property for that, or it'll be in the neighbor's yard. Mm-hmm. So it's just a lot. It's a lot more than we anticipated. And going back to, you know, you've got to clear all of, you know, the blackberries and so forth. Mm-hmm. If you're going to clear that on on four acres, that's totally different than clearing that on 30 acres. Right, right. What could take a weekend or two <laughs> really takes a very long time on 30 acres. So what were some of the other lessons that you learned along the way? So with big land, we also needed um, bigger equipment because our land was hilly. And so when we had broilers at the top of the hill or pigs down at the bottom of the hill, we had to bring the feed there somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also when the grass got really tall, you have to do something about it. And Mm -hmm. our first year on the farm, we hired somebody to come cut hay for us. And it wasn't very, it wasn't like planned, planned out hay. So it wasn't like nutritious. It wasn't, Mm -hmm. it was just cutting the grass really. Um, (laughs) (laughs) the tall grass, but then eventually we ended up buying a tractor and tractors can be kind of a big investment. And at that point we didn't have, you know, thousands of dollars to buy a used tractor, um, sitting around. So we ended up getting the brand new 0% interest, um, Kubota tractor, which is really a foolish decision looking back to jump into that when you can't afford a, um, you know, you don't have 10,000 sitting around for a used tractor or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. um, to jump in and buy the the twenty thousand dollar tractor. That's not wise. <laughs> so, absolutely. So, I, and, and that you're absolutely correct. Um, equipment. You know, it, the bigger you get, the more expensive you're talking. And along with that, now you have maintenance that you have to do on it, and you know because you want to keep the equipment running well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know you've got to buy the implements to do what you want to do, and that adds to it. Right. Uh, and then not only that, I mean, I, this past week's podcast, I, I talked about the dangers of, mm-hmm. of homesteading and, you know, tractors are one of the number one causes of uh, injury and death on a homestead. And so you kind of add that as well to the whole mix. Um, and not only is it a bit of a, shall we say a financial drain, but, you know, it can be kind of a mental taxing drain on you as well as you worry about making sure your kids are safe and, you know, right. you probably didn't grow up running a tractor. No. Uh, so there's a learning curve there. Right. And I tend to be safe, <laughs> very safe and cautious. Um, so there was one point where there was a ravine on our property that was coated in blackberries. And my husband was just really excited to get it cleared away because he had this tractor, but I was scared because, you couldn't see what, what the land looked like mm-hmm. underneath those blackberries. How deep did it go? Is it safe to just drive a tractor into this ravine? So, yeah, there were definitely moments where um, that big tractor scared me. So, yeah, Absolutely. So we've got uh, more land. You've got to manage it. It means more equipment. It means that things potentially are farther away. Yes, definitely. 
Yeah. And then when you've got a really large property, that means your neighbors are further away too, just by nature of how big the property is. And so um, we didn't have any neighbors that we could just chat with over the fence Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, if we needed help because our, our piglets we just bought were running towards the highway, (laughs) you know, that really did happen to us. Nobody was right by us. Mm -hmm. Um, We didn't have anybody. So it was just us, just and that's a bit of a culture shock for somebody who is coming from a suburban area where people are living on top of everybody. Yes. Um, where you where you don't see your neighbors and you don't you know know your na- I mean, in, in some rural areas, you know, if somebody lives within ten minutes of you, they're your neighbor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe even even uh, farther than that, they would still be considered your neighbor. You know, some people. I know out in the in the in the western part of the United States, you know, they're li- they might live a half hour from their closest neighbor, yeah, uh, which just is mind boggling to me. Um, we're on a little over two acres here, and thankfully we do have very good neighbors. Um, and sometimes, though, I, I wish I was a little farther away. I'm going to be honest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. There, so there were some neighbors at the bottom of our driveway that were just close enough that they would burn a lot of garbage <laughs> that mm. we could smell that smoke. <laughs> but uh. that's just, <laughs> that's um, the closest neighbors we had. So, but we didn't have any um, neighbors near us who were farming, nobody. Mm. So there wasn't anybody to glean knowledge from or to help each other out or to, mm-hmm. you know, lend each other equipment. There we didn't have anybody like that. And, and that mentorship, especially for somebody who was brand new to, to homesteading, um, right. at, at really, in my opinion, at any size, you know, it, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter the scale mentorship, I think is so key. Right. Um, but uh, definitely when you're on, on that large of a, of a piece of property and you're trying to learn all of these things on the fly, I can imagine that was rather overwhelming Uh, to not have that mentorship. Right. Yes. I knew I had two friends who were raising chickens and that's it. And the day our baby chicks arrived, my husband had built a brooder with the boys. um, And he built that in our neighborhood driveway before we moved to the farm. It was just ready to go. Um, And the day the baby chicks arrived at the post office, I went and picked them up and I called that like one of those friends that lived the closest, but was still a ways away who knew how to raise chickens. And I said, can you come over, please <laughs> help me? What do I do? And she came over and her teenage son looked at our brooder and said, you don't have a lid. <laughs> we, <laughs> we hadn't built a lid yet. <laughs> and so he said, I have an idea. And he went and took our screen door <laughs> off of the back of our house and put it over the brooder. And it was never the same again, but we had a lid. <laughs> so we were Interesting. Just- so unprepared. <laughs> but, and those are the things though, you don't know what you don't know. And unless you have somebody that's willing to, to provide that information to you, um, it's very, very easy to, to make mistakes. Uh, and sometimes those mistakes can end up costing you a lot of money. Right. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. When we didn't have a very good lid for our brooder, one of our barn cats got into the brooder. So mm-hmm. yes, that costs a lot because. Yep. So yep. There you go. Yep. <laughs> uh, um, and, and then the, I guess the other thing as well is when you've got that much land, um, mm-hmm. kind of going back to that, that idea there, again, the, the opportunities to make costly mistakes um, yeah. is, is kind of exponential. Yes, definitely. So we didn't have good fencing for, we had, um, so later on, on the farm, we had some Jersey cows and one gave birth and it was a, a male Jersey that wouldn't, um, wouldn't nurse. So he was failure to thrive. Didn't even want to take a bottle. It was, um, a difficult situation, but our fencing wasn't good enough to keep in a calf. Um, and so he escaped and our grass was tall at that point. So we were wandering 30 acres. We split up as a family, took our cell phones out and we're just wandering, looking for this little baby cow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he could, I mean, it was a hot summer day. He could have 
died out there. Thankfully, we did find him. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up giving him away after that because it was just too much trouble to keep um, a failure to thrive male jersey. Yeah, and and at the end of the day, those are uh, pretty much good for one thing and one thing only. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Uh, in fact, a total side note here, but a couple of years ago, there was a live local livestock auction here. And my dad and I happened to, to go to, a, actually it was a, it was a, they, they would kind of do estate sales at starting at seven. Then at nine o'clock they would start selling animals. And so my dad and I wandered back to the animal sale one evening and there happened to be a little Jersey bull calf there. Nice. And, uh, with those just ab, just the gorgeous, you know, doe eyes that they have, mm-hmm. um, and it's a good thing I didn't have any cash on me because that poor little calf sold for a dollar and mm-hmm. I wasn't going to bid on my credit card. I was yeah. going to put a dollar on my credit card or else I would have come home with a bull calf for a buck. And yeah. that probably would have cost me a lot of capital with my wife. Right. <laughs> right. So anyhow, a total side note there. So were there any other lessons that you kind of learned um, as far as the the larger piece of property is concerned? Yes. So we didn't need that much land, really. Um, Even with raising broilers and um, pigs and turkeys and ducks and geese, and we had a big 50 by 50 garden. Um, And then eventually we did bring in three um, cows, uh, beef cows as well. And then later brought in some dairy cows, but even with all of that, we didn't use all 30 acres. So there was plenty of acreage that just, we never touched. We just, it just sat there. So it wasn't necessary at all. Yeah. I feel like an average family could easily get by on less than five acres. Don't need that much land. Uh, absolutely. And, and I mean, you know, some of it definitely does depend on what you're trying to do, but with, with regards to what you've described and what most people are trying to accomplish with a homestead, I, I would 100% agree. Um, mm-hmm. The more land you have, the more maintenance you have to do. And as you said, the more fencing you have to do and the farther away things are and, you know, it, bigger is not always better. Right. And then also it's harder to sell large land. So when we did go to sell our property, um, it was hard to sell because people couldn't get a loan on that much land. The banks didn't want to put much value in the land. Mm -hmm. They wanted to put the majority of the value in the house. Mm -hmm. And it had been a bank owned property. It had been um, neglected. The house was not in good shape when we bought it. We remodeled it, but it still wasn't, it it wasn't beautiful. Um, So it was hard to put a lot of value into that house. So when we ended up selling it, we had, it was three separate tax lots. Um, the bank would only loan on the house and the two acres right around the house. And then we had to hold a loan for the buyers for the rest of the property. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that was difficult to sell. And that, I mean, there's a lot of risk there uh, mm-hmm. for you financially. Right. Um, if things go south now, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're kind of stuck. Right. Right. Or we end up getting back, you know, 28 acres with no house on it. Right. Right. <laughs> it should be awkward. Uh, yeah. And, and now, and now you guys are in Virginia. So what are you going to do with that land? So we are not on land right now. We're on about a quarter acre at this point. Um, so it's not a lot. And at this point, so it's interesting when we first moved here, our thought was we're not farming. Um, we've done that. We're tired <laughs> and, um, and we're going to have a smaller, easy to maintain um, piece of property. And I don't know why, maybe it's um, when COVID hit, I think I started just gardening again, like crazy more than um, we did right before we moved here. Um, so now we're just really wishing because property is more affordable here than it was in Oregon we're kind of wishing we had got the, you know, an acre maybe or gotcha. something. Yeah. So how, how long ago did you uh, relocate or I shouldn't say relocate? How long ago did you uh, move to Virginia? So we moved to Virginia six months ago. Okay. So kind of what uh, you, you felt like you had failed at the whole homesteading slash farming thing. Yeah. What really led you though to, to, 
decide, okay, we're going to leave this behind and move to Virginia? What was kind of that, the, the background to that? Okay. So we, we sold our farm. Uh, so it was about six years ago, we sold our farm. So, okay. and then we ended up living in a neighborhood again after. Okay. Um, so we've been in just neighborhood. Um, so we, we ended up um, moving to Virginia. Um, part of it is because a lot of my family moved to Tennessee, um, to Knoxville area. And my husband is a software guy and there's not big software companies right around where they live. And so he was having trouble finding a job there. But his um, current job, the job he worked for in Oregon, has um, their company in Virginia. So he could work in Virginia. And that's in driving distance to Knoxville. So that was part of it for us. And then also part of it was two years ago, we took a road trip across the whole country. And one of our very favorite states was Virginia. And it's just beautiful. It's um, green like Oregon. But I like the hills. It doesn't have the giant mountains like Oregon, but um, they call it mountains here. (laughs) They're hills (laughs) to us anyways. But I think it's beautiful here. And and so we started looking at Virginia when we were on our road trip two years ago, just, but no family was over um, this side of the country at all. And so it was just kind of a thought like, yeah, it'd be nice, but nobody's there. So then when my whole family said they were moving to Knoxville and then we took it more seriously, we can do this, we can move over there. And then we're in driving distance of family. And so um, I I guess kind of backing up just a little bit, um, you, you, you left the farm, you went to the neighborhood in, in Oregon, I I guess you were still Mm -hmm. there. Yes. Uh huh. And and how big of a piece of property was that? Less than a quarter acre lot. And and at that point, you weren't doing anything with raising food. Just gardening and planted fruit trees again. It's Uh just kind of a thing I like to do. And and had put there was like, you know, all the neighbors in the neighborhood had pretty landscaping out front, and I had an apple tree out there. (laughs) Just I don't know why I can't leave the growing food thing behind me. I just have to do it everywhere. Nice. Yeah, yes. I, it's just one of those things. I think it's just a bug, you know. When once you're bitten by it, it's it's almost like a disease. Yeah. Uh, which I mean, I guess there's a lot worse things to be infected by. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're you're in Virginia. Um, your kids at this point are teenagers. Yes. So we have five now, and our oldest is 18, and our youngest is 10. And your 18 year old relocated with you to Virginia? Yes. Uh huh. He just graduated from high school this year. We homeschool, so that made it easier to move in mm-hmm. January. So, <laughs> and, and how do, I mean, how did they handle the transition? Oh, they've handled it really well. Um, so, yeah, we've been able to meet people here pretty quickly. Um, thankfully, even before um, all the quarantine stuff happened. <laughs> Because that's it's harder to get to know people in a brand new place when you can't really go places. So absolutely, and, and so you said it was January of this year that you made the leap to Virginia. Yes, we drove across the country and yep, left Oregon. Wow, wow! Yeah. The funny thing is, you you talk about people moving to Tennessee, and um, we're kind of experiencing some of that ourselves. Where um, my my one brother that used to live about an hour from us, um, his wife's family, entire family packed up and moved to Tennessee, I think four, maybe four years ago, five years ago. Wow. And about two years ago, they moved to Tennessee. And uh, my mom and dad have been talking about potentially relocating to Tennessee. And uh, so <laughs> who yes. knows? Uh, I'm not going to say never. Um, yeah. my, my thing is this, I love upstate New York. I, I make no mm-hmm. bones about it. Every one of my podcasts, I talk about beautiful upstate New York. I do love it here. Yes. Uh, and I love the four seasons. I, I have always said, if I was going to leave this area, I would probably go to New Hampshire. Um, yeah. but, uh, on the other hand, there is something to be uh, about being close to family that mm-hmm. is, is definitely very, very nice. Right. Right. Yeah, we um, drove through upstate New York on our road trip. It was beautiful there too. So pretty. We um, we drove all the way up to Malone, New mm-hmm. York, and yep. 
we listened to Farmer Boy. Um, oh, yeah. On the way. And then we visited Almanzo's farm that he grew up on. That is so, very cool, isn't it? Yes, very cool. I, the, I, um, again, total side note here, but whatever. Um, back, oh, I don't even know how old my son was. Um, I actually read through the entire A Little House on the Prairie series with him. I would read a chapter every night and um, that was kind of our thing. And so we actually finished up Farmer Boy and uh, we happened to be on vacation up near Plattsburgh um, doing some camping. And so we popped over to the farm uh, as, as a family and it was just so absolutely fascinating. It was really, really cool to see that in, in real life. Yes. It's living history. It was, yeah, just really, really um, made the story hit home for our kids. And there's a part in Farmer Boy where um, the kids are left home alone, and one of the and I think they eat all the they sugar. Eat all the sugar. And, yep. And, yep. And then they're painting the stove. They're cleaning up the house and painting the stove right before their parents come back. And then I can't remember which one of the kids. I think Alonzo's sister maybe threw the paintbrush. And it hit the wall and there was a paint mark on the wall. And so as we're standing there in this dining room at Almanzo's house, then I think my husband asked, okay, where's the paint mark? Where is it? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, uh, yeah. It, yeah. Was just, it was so cool to see that. In fact, one of the things um, that on my bucket list is actually to go out and do the Laura Ingalls Wilder tour from Pepin, Wisconsin on down, you know, through to independence and out to Desmet and, and all of those things. Yeah. I just, I, I absolutely love that series. I, I, yes. I do. And, yeah. and, which is it's probably funny to hear a grown man say that he loves that series, but whatever. No, um, it's great. <laughs> I, I do. I, I just, I, like I said, I'm, I'm in the process of reading through it again and I've probably yes. read it at least 10 times in my life, if not more. Yes. Um, I'm just yes. Like, uh, anyhow, that's a, a, a wild goose chase there, but a uh, rabbit trail to go down. Um, so you guys are in Virginia now, and mm -hmm. um, you are starting to raise some more or grow some more of your own food yes. um, on, on, your, on your property there. Um, yeah. But you're also in the process of writing a book, um, yeah. again, that I, I think is unfair to you, but I'm not going <laughs> to beat you up on it, but uh, you're kind of working title is how we failed at homesteading. Yes. And then subtitle 10 mistakes you don't have to make. And which I think is so awesome to, yes. that you're looking at it from the standpoint of the lessons that you learned yes. and how you can share those with other people to help them keep from making the same mistakes that you did. And, and today really we covered what may be chapter four. Yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. which is bigger isn't always better. It's my right. recommendation for the title. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for taking time to join us here today on the podcast. Um, you have a blog, wellfedhomestead.com. Yes. Um, and uh, you've got some eBooks there. Any other things that you want to share with the listeners? No, I think that's all. So be watching for my book. I think um, I plan to publish this August. So just check out the website and you can join the mailing list and I'll definitely send out updates about it there. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for, for joining me. This has been a, a great conversation and I hope it helps people. It's not that we're trying to squash anybody's dream. Um, you know, to have the goal of the five, the 10, the 15, the 20 acres is certainly a beautiful dream, but also just be careful what you wish for. Yes, definitely. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I hope that you found it helpful. Again, the point of this is not to squelch anybody's dreams, okay? So let me just reiterate that. But also be careful what you wish for. And also understand that, A, you don't have to wait until you have the 5, the 10, the 15, the 20 acres of land to start your homesteading journey. And B, it's not a requirement to go big in order to be a successful homesteader. So if the only reason why you want the 5, the 10, the 15, the 20 acres of land is because you feel like that's what you have to have in order to be a quote-unquote, and I'm using huge air quotes here, real homesteader,
let me assure you that that is certainly not the case. Anyhow, if you have any comments or questions, anything at all, you can reach me. Brian at the homesteadjourney.net is my email address, or we are on Instagram, Facebook, and we also have our YouTube channel. Speaking of our YouTube channel, we did put out a video this week with regards to the pig water level indicator that I built last weekend. And so you'll definitely want to check that out if you haven't already. Links will be in the show notes below. As always, the music on this episode is courtesy of Audionautics.com. So a big shout out and thank you to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.